All right, everybody, welcome to Emotional Poverty Webinar with Ruby Payne. And uh, we have you all muted to cut down on the background noise and the recording quality. So we're going to encourage you to use the chat feature for your questions and comments. And thanks to all of those who have been telling us where you're from, what you do, and what you'd like to get out of this. So without any more uh, introductions, we're going to turn it over to Ruby. Well, it's wonderful to have you on board with me for this uh, webinar. It's going to be about 45 minutes in length. And then we'll open it up for some questions at the end. And it's on the book, Emotional Poverty, and what that means. So what I'd like to do is show you this kind of graphic of what's in the book. And so what the book is written actually heavily skewed toward educators. And so it looks at these topics, okay? Why do students explode? What happens when you actually physically have an unintegrated, unregulated brain and what that means? What motivates behavior? The research is it's very hard to change behavior, but you can change the motivation for the behavior. And that's referred to in the clinical research as the inner self or the core self. The next box is the next chapter in the book is why do discipline strategies work with some students and not with others? And how do you know who's going to shoot? There's, there's two groups that shooters come from. Now, just because you're in that group doesn't mean you're going to shoot, okay? Just means that you have a way to kind of do some preventative uh, analysis, bonding and attachment. And then we look at the systems level. What kinds of things happen at the systems level that make this uh, an issue? And one is all the less than and separate from experiences that occur uh, and how you get a campus triage plan, how you begin to not necessarily eliminate those, but lessen those. Why so many discipline referrals for males? If you look at the research right now, 76% uh, of educators K-12 are female, but 50% of the student population is male. But the majority of our discipline referrals, the majority of our special ed kids, the majority of our non-readers, majority of our dropouts are male. So you have to look at this and say, actually, the numbers don't work. And why is that? And one of the reasons is that male and female brains actually process or tend to process emotion differently. And so we will talk about that. And then the last one is, what does the adult bring into this mix? This whole concept of emotional noise, okay? And those of you in the school business, you know that there's more noise before holidays, more noise after holidays. You know that some classrooms have more noise in it than others do. And so this is the chapter in which we look at what the adults bring into the equation to increase noise level. And we look particularly at adult development uh, stages that adults go through um, and how that impacts, impacts their emotional responses. Adults go through developmental stages just like uh, kids do. Yes, and do. many people don't know about that. So we're going to look at that. But as we get started here, if you don't mind, one of the things I'm going to ask you to do is put in the chat box the name of one of your, not the name, just the first letter of the name of one of your students or an adult you work with that if they were not in your life, life would be easier. So if you don't mind typing in the chat box the first initial of that person and tell me whether they're male or female. So if you would do that for me, please, that would help me so much. Okay, and what I'm gonna ask you to do, thank you for doing that, I'm gonna ask you to kind of hold that person in your head as we move through the training. Um, who is that person? and as I talk about some of the issues and strategies. So what I'm gonna do now is just hit lightly on several of the topics that are in the book. And then um, if you're interested in the, the actual online training is six hours. So if you're interested in that, you can get more info. Um, well, first of all, it's not financial poverty, it's emotional poverty, and it actually occurs in all demographics. And the reason I wrote this book is this. Everywhere I go right now, 
uh, educators are dealing with more and more emotional issues to the point that it's very difficult to get to instruction. And the second thing that happens is they're trying to use discipline strategies on emotional issues, and it's actually not working. And so when you become an educator, you actually don't have to know anything about emotional realities. And so we don't even name it. And what we know is that it doesn't matter whether you're affluent or whether you're financially poor, there's equal issues across the board. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but most of the mass uh, school shootings occur in affluent high schools. And there's more anxiety, it seems to be, at the uh, uh, in uh, more affluent schools as well. So one, yes. So one of the things we're going to look at is what is emotional poverty? So I need to tell you, you're not going to find it in the DSM-5, okay? It's not a clinical disorder. If you could show me in the chat box, how many of you know what the DSM-5 is? Okay. For those of you who don't know, the DSM-5 is the book of mental health. It's what the insurance companies use to decide how to code your issue for insurance coverage. And basically, the rule is this. If it's not listed in the DSM-5, you can't have it, okay? So it's not, yes, it's a diagnostic book for clinicians. It's not going to be in that. But it is actually four things in the, in the research. If you look at the research, the brain is unregulated and unintegrated. It's actually a physical thing. Attachment and bonding are not secure. The inner self is underdeveloped and dominated by deep hurts. And the external environment makes you feel less than and separate from. And as we get in this, I want to say I had a secondary teacher. By the way, if you're secondary and you're on this webinar, would you type yes in the chat box for me, please? If you're secondary. Yes. One of the things is, is uh, I had a secondary teacher say to me, oh, you're just doing a hug, a thug workshop. And I laughed right out loud. So one of the things is, is that one of the issues for secondary teachers right now is that they're not necessarily interested in all the emotional issue as much as they are want to be stay, safe. So we talk about that as well. Why are kids killing kids? And what does that mean as we move through it? So having said that, we will always have consequences, but we, it's an approach we need to think differently. So as we start in this, there's just some basic things. Yeah, Cynthia made me laugh. Okay. There's just some basic things that we need to know about emotions. And what I did is I went back to the clinical research because I thought, I want to have a basic understanding. Where do we get our emotions? What do we do with them? How do they develop? What happens when they're underdeveloped? Um, and what do we do about it? So it's basically about a basic language to talk about it and then basic strategies for dealing with it. So the first thing I need to say is this, all emotional safety is rooted in two things, safety and belonging. When anybody gets upset, you, me, anybody, it's because we think our safety or belonging has been jeopardized in some way. In fact, I read this one book called The Polyvagal Theory, and it's his theory and his documentation that basically all mental illness is actually caused by a lack of safety. So one of the things is safety or belonging. The second thing about emotions is this. They're pretty easy in this way. You're either moving towards something or you're moving away from something. In other words, I like this. It feels good to me. I'm going to approach it. I don't like it. I'm going to run from it. And that's why it's not possible for the brain to be both angry and compassionate at the same time. It's just not possible. Because when you're angry, you're attacking. When you're compassionate, you're moving toward. And anger is moving away from, you're after your attack, where compassion is, is an approach. And so one of the things is, it's not possible for the brain to have them both. So number one, all emotional wellness is about safety and belonging at the very essence. And number two, emotions are pretty simple. 
in that you're moving towards something or you're moving away from it. So one of the biggest issues that we do initially, and number three is this, you can't change behavior unless you can name it. And number four, okay, it's very difficult to change behavior. What you can do is change the motivation for the behavior. And the, number five, the basic difference between good and non-beneficial behavior is one simple thing, it's compassion. Um, and so there's a, I'll, I'll, we won't have time to go into that in depth, but it's compassion for yourself or for others. Um, and so as we start moving through these basic concepts, uh, let me go through them one more time with you, okay? Number one, everything is about safety and belonging. Number two, you're either in your emotional world moving towards something or moving away from it. Number three, you can't change a behavior unless you can name it. Number four, okay, is that one of the things we know is that it's difficult to change the behavior, but you can change the motivation for the behavior. And number five, it's about compassion. Compassion, self-compassion, compassion for the others is the biggest delineator between a good behavior or the motivation for good behavior and the motivation for destructive behavior. One of the most interesting guys I read was a guy named Stosny. Stosny is a clinical researcher and he researched why men beat women. And his research was fascinating. Um, and he is one of the people who identifies compassion, but it's in a lot of the literature. So the first thing we do when we approach this is very important to understand about the physicality of the brain and an unintegrated, unregulated brain. And what is that? And so some of you might know Siegel, but Stosny says this, emotion is processed 200 to 5,000 times faster than thought. So one of the things that happens is processed so fast that's very difficult for thought to actually be involved. And since survival is processed at the brain stem level, when you get upset and you go to survival, all your blood flow leaves the part of the brain that does reasoning and thinking, and you can't think anyway. So emotional processing is very fast. So there's a, a model that I like that I'm gonna show you very quickly by a guy named Siegel. He has, he's out of UCLA and he um, uses this model. He says, your brain is a lot like your hand. So I wanna explain it to you because we, one of the things we do is we teach this to students because it becomes a way they can name their behavior. But let me ask you this in the chat box. How many of you have had a student just explode on you in the last couple of weeks or an adult for that matter? Yeah, <laughs> today. All right. When that happens, it's your, the first thing you have to say to yourself is, okay, I'm dealing with an unregulated, unintegrated brain. So let me explain this to you. In your hand right now, your brain is, your palm is your brain stem which is your involuntary systems. Your wrist is your spinal cord, okay? And what your involuntary systems do is this. They're all the things that you do almost not consciously, eating, sleeping, uh, uh, breathing, their uh, motivational systems like sexual pleasure, et cetera. And in survival mode, you go back to here, okay? Your thumb is your amygdala. A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A. -A -A. Now, this brain model I'm showing you is an oversimplification, but it will give you a, a concept. Amygdala is your thumb. Okay, it's where you store your basic emotional data. And it is structured by the time you are three. Okay, now it gets restructured when you're in an adolescent, but you're structured by the time you're three. And what happens when you're an infant? You have so much stimuli coming at you so fast. What you do is you sort, is this safe or do I belong? In other words, when somebody comes to you with a bottle, 
Do you smell that? You like it? Do you want it? You move toward it. Okay. If you like that person, you move toward it. Okay. If it's dangerous, not safe, you move away from it. And not only do people are not only are people safe and and, and dangerous, but also environments are. I read an art, uh, article about a foundation in Africa, and they were asking midwives um, what they could buy for them or purchase for them that would make the biggest difference in their lives. And the midwives said a flashlight. And they said a flashlight. And they said, yes, many times at night we're called out to deliver a baby. The roads are dark and we're walking on these roads and they're poisonous snakes. And if we just had a flashlight, we would not get bitten. So environments, people are dangerous, they're safe, you move toward it, you move away from it. And that's what we sign meaning to, okay? I like this, I move toward it. It has significance for me. Amygdala is where you release cortisol. And one of the most interesting things about the amygdala is this, you record things in that amygdala without awareness. If it's structured by the time you're three, what happens is you have a lot of experiences that occur to you before you ever have language. So it is recorded there and you act on it even though you don't know why. Let me ask you this question to respond in the chat box. How many of you have done something and then you thought to yourself, oh no, that's my mother again, that's my father again. How many has that happened to you? Right, yeah. And the thing is, it happens because you recorded that before you ever had language, and so you act on it, okay? The next part of your brain is the back of your hand, and that is your cortex, and literally, that's where your thoughts are, okay? So you, you move to thoughts here, okay? Ideas, representations, it allows you to think about thinking, okay? Your two middle fingers of your hand are your prefrontal cortex, and that's where you regulate your brain, okay? It's where you control impulsivity, insight and empathy. You enact moral judgments, okay? Let me ask you this question in the chat box. How many of you have been out on the freeway? There was somebody on the freeway driving in a way you did not like, and you thought seriously about just helping them off the road, you know? I'll connect my bumper to your bumper and push you off the road. Okay. In the chat box, what did you say to yourself to keep from doing that? Why didn't you do that? What What did you say to yourself? Yeah, they may be armed. It's not worth it. Okay. All right. Some of you said <laughs> insurance. <laughs> Give them an excuse. Maybe they're going to the hospital. Yeah. Right. The bottom line is this you had a regulator. And what happens is this, what it means when your brain is integrated and regulated, it means this, that your thumb is talking to your, your emotional self is talking to your brain stem and is covered with your thoughts. It's integrated and it's regulated, okay, by your prefrontal cortex, okay? And here's what happens when it's not integrated and it's not regulated. It's in your face. And it's explosion. And one of the things that happens is when you're, you have a student or adult in front of you and they're like this, our first sense is how disrespectful. And a lot of times it goes back to this then. We respond this way. Well, the problem is this. If you have somebody in front of you and they're like this, and then you're like this, what you have are two unregulated, unintegrated brains in the room. And it's disastrous, okay? So one of the things we do is we say, first things, if you wanna deal with this, one of the things we do, for those of you at elementary school, one of the things we do is we work on teaching regulation because you have a lot of four and five-year-olds, six-year-olds who come in and their brains actually aren't regulated. They actually don't have a voice to uh, control them. Their prefrontal cortex is not developed. So you can go on our website and we have a book you can download for free and you run it off these lessons, okay? And each, like or if you have a preschool or school uh, 
you run off these lessons and each child has a uh, teddy bear or a stuffed animal and they teach their stuffed animals every day how to behave at school or how to behave okay and every time their teddy bears good all day i.e they're good all day they get to give the teddy bear a sticker and sometimes they're having a, a problem day so we just say to them, you know honey your teddy bear is really having a problem today i need you to go back and reteach this teddy bear how to do this and what happens then is you are actually giving them an internal voice a, a way to deal with their issues in developing that prefrontal cortex now one of the things we say is that when you have this explosion the first thing you have to say to yourself is this i got an unregulated unintegrated brain in front of me the second question you have to ask is is this a safety issue if it is i have to deal with that Number three, did I teach the child the hand model of the brain? Because when you teach that to students, one of the things you can say to them when they get calmed down, and I'm going to give you some calming techniques, is you can say to them, did your brain just do this? And they'll go, uh-huh. And we'll say, okay, what do we have to do so your brain does this? And so one of the things is you can talk about their behavior without it being about them. And then we have to calm them down. Now, one of the reasons you want to calm them down is simply this, okay? When they get upset like this, all the blood flow went here. The blood flow left the cortex and the prefrontal cortex, and they can't think anyway. There's no point in having a conversation. So the first thing you have to do is calm them down. One of the things we do, one of your best tools for calming them down is water, okay? If you just make them drink 10 to 12 ounces of water, water metabolizes cortisol. And you, your amygdala, your thumb, produces cortisol. So one of the things you want to do is metabolize that and get it out of their system. And one of the ways you know that happens is when their shoulders relax, okay? Let me just say this as an aside very quickly. There's a whole chapter in the book on how males process uh, the hard research about it. It's kind of a controversial topic right now because people don't want to admit that there might be some differences, but actually there's, there's some hard data. Now, it's not going to be true for everybody, but it's true for quite a few. In the brain imaging, computers can predict with accuracy at least two thirds of the time, whether they're dealing with a male brain or a female brain. So one of the things, just by the imaging, but in a male brain, there's mud, more blood flow within hemispheres, okay? So your right hemisphere has to do with emotion, your left hemisphere has a lot to do with language, analytical thinking. In a female brain, there's more blood flow across hemispheres, okay? So let me give you an example about this water business and, and male processing. Look, when a female brain in the MRI brain scans, now we're not talking about bodies, we're talking about brains, and it's only gonna be true, it's not gonna be true about 80 to 90% of females and 80 to 90% of males, okay? But when a female brain has an emotional hit in the brain research, Okay, that is throughout the whole brain within two minutes. And the first thing a female brain will do is cry or talk, cry and talk. It's called tend and befriend. When a male brain has an emotional hit, it's in the base of the skull right here and in the right hemisphere. And in the research, on the average, how many hours does it take before this information gets throughout the whole brain? If you don't mind typing in the chat box. How many hours would you say? Yeah. The research is it's about three to five, depends on the individual. And the first thing that a male brain wants to do when they have an emotional hit is be left alone and be silent, okay? Now, one of the biggest issues we do in the school business is this. Two male students get in a fight. 
they get hauled in front of a female educator. And what is the first thing we say to them? Talk to me, tell me what happened, okay? Hey, they barely know they've been in a fight yet a lot of times. And the, the issue is this, then we punish him a second time for being recalcitrant, defiant, disrespectful, uncooperative. We don't discipline girls a second time when they cry and talk. We sure do with males, okay? So one of the things I'm gonna say is let me give you a, a different strategy, okay? First of all, when you're dealing with a male student, understand that they're gonna take more processing time and that the conversation across hemispheres, okay, is not as quick, okay, because they have more blood flow within hemispheres. So this thing of matching language and feelings, not always easy to do. And so give them water and watch them and have them drink water. When their shoulders relax, you know the cortisol started walking and don't talk to them during that time. Number two, for whatever reason, Males don't, in the research, males prefer shoulder to shoulder conversations, not eye to eye. Number three, I don't, not sure why this is true, but actually male brains will utilize language better if they can do something with their hands while they talk, okay? Uh, like if I want my son to talk to me, I'll say to him, would you cook with me? And then he'll start talking, okay? So one of the things is you're, you're looking at this processing time. Another tool that I wanna share with you that I just love is, is your eyes. You have students who won't quit crying, okay? Or who are always upset. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have students, they walk down the hall, their heads are bowed, they got their heads covered with a hoodie and their shoulders are slumped? How many of you have that? Right. Okay, what you know about that student right away is this, they're processing negative talk and it's an emotional issue. So let me explain this, okay? If you think of my face as a clock, okay? This is 12 o'clock, this is six o'clock, this is three o'clock, this is nine o'clock. Whenever your eyes are anywhere across the top of your head right now, right here up, what your brain is doing is accessing what has been stored visually. Okay, do something for me right now if you don't mind. Bow your head, okay? Think about how you felt when you graduated from high school. Now look at the ceiling, okay? All right, in the chat box, what happened to your thought? Yeah, it left, uh-huh, uh-huh, le it leaves you. See, let me explain. When your eyes are up like that, it's not possible to access emotion. It's not. The next time you wanna cry, but you don't wanna cry, look up. You can't get your feelings. When your eyes are across the top of your head like this, okay, you're accessing what's stored visually. When your eyes are moving between your ears, it's auditory. When your eyes are down, you're processing emotion. I know a principal who's got a bad back, he really does. But when he's got an angry parent in his office, he'll say to him, do you mind if I stand up a little bit? My back is bothering me. And when he stands up, they're forced to look up and they calm down, okay? Uh, and so one of the things you do is we have kids look at the ceiling. I had a third grade boy in my office. He was just out of control sobbing. So I said to him, look, I need you to look at the ceiling for me and draw a guitar. Okay, now you make them point with their finger, okay, so their finger's up like that so that they're forced to look up. And I said, I want you to point up there, pretend your pencil, your finger's your pencil. I want you to draw a guitar for me up there. Okay, he said, why? I said, it'll help you calm down. Okay, and then he drew it for a while. I watched his shoulders, they relaxed. And then I, so we started talking, and he got upset again. I said, I need you to go up there and color in that guitar. What color are you using? And uh, I had to do it with him three or four times, but the research is this. Once you break the intensity of that emotional pattern, uh, you can't go back to it anymore. It's very difficult to go back. I know one elementary school, they have pictures of puppies and dogs and everything on the, the uh, ceilings of their hallways. 
And when a kid gets upset, they'll go, oh, look at that, okay? And so it just calms them down, okay? That's amazing. Uh, take a minute and talk or in the chat box. How many of you will use that strategy? Yeah, it's just a minute. Now, there's more to it than this because we teach them how to use their, a lot of your students get upset because they're having academic trouble. And there's a way you can even tell, um, teach students to make their uh, eyes function as a camera and take pictures, but you, their eyes have to be in the up position. I don't have time to uh, explain that part. So what we do is we calm them down and there's several strategies in the book. Section two of the book is what motivates bad behavior? And it has to do with your inner self, okay? And we talked about this compassion, et cetera, and what that means. Your ability to compassion. And in the brain research, this thumb, this amygdala, is constructed, as I said earlier, by the time you're three. It gets reconstructed in adolescence when your brain reprunes itself. And what it is, it works with the limbic area of the brain to set this rubrics of behaviors and beliefs that give you meaning in your life. Now, in the book, I outline how you, what happens birth to 18 to set that up. And basically, it's a continuum. Uh, one of the things we know is this, is that you build the inner self and it becomes the inner self that you act off of. It becomes the motivation for your behavior. Now, one of the things that people ask me a lot is this, aren't there inherited components as well as environmental? And the answer is yes. I don't know how many of you know uh, uh, Jordan Peterson. How many of you know Jordan Peterson, his work? Uh, if you do, please type in the chat box, Jordan Peterson. Uh, I absolutely adore him. He is a clinical psychologist out of Canada, and he wrote the book, 12 Rules of Life. He has a website called www.understandmyself.com, and for $9.95, you can go on this website, and he'll give you your scale on 100 against all of these, okay? But in the research across the world, regardless of culture, regardless of gender, there are four, there are five continuums, if you will, that tend to have an inherited component. One is agreeableness versus disagreeable, conscientious versus less conscientious, extroversion, introversion, neuroticism, less neurotic, openness experience, less open to experience. And we know that autism and anxiety can have genetic roots as well, okay? But we know this is that, like, for example, birth the one-year-old. You have to figure out where you are on the trust versus distrust continuum. In other words, if I think this environment is safe and this person is safe, I'm going to trust. If I'm not sure about that, when my parent leaves, I don't know about that, I don't like it, I'm autistic, I don't like to be touched, then you're over here on the distrust side. And wherever you are on that continuum then, okay, ends up shaping this, this thumb, okay? For example, we know that if in that first year of life, you kind of decide you can't trust adults, distrust, then all your life, authority is gonna kind of be an issue for you, okay? Because, you know, can't trust them, okay? So one of the things is that, and we know that people get stuck in a chronological, in an emotional age, not a chronological age, let me give you this example. I was in an elementary school and this principal said to me, Ruby, I don't know what to do. She said, I have this um, fourth grade girl. She's 11 years old and she will not make a bowel movement in the toilet. She makes it on the floor. I said, well, tell me about this girl. And she said, well, she got put in foster care when she was three years old. I said, look, she's a three-year-old emotionally. She said, I said, because the research is you will, wherever your abuse occurred, you'll stay there until you get therapy, okay, and start moving again. She said, but she's 11 years old. I said, chronologically, she's 11 years old. Emotionally, she's three years old. That's where you develop autonomy and potty training, 
okay? So you can get stuck in an age, okay? A emotional age versus a chronological age. Now, why is this inner thumb so important? It's the motivation for your behavior. So for example, if I, in this development phrase stage, I've, I've developed more on the distrust side than the trust side. I've developed more on the guilt and shame side than the autonomy and initiative side. Then I'm going to be weak. My thumb is going to be weak. And I'm going to see myself as unimportant, unattractive, less than, separate from, misunderstood, unlovable. On the other hand, if I developed along the continuum with more trust and more autonomy, more initiative, more industry, then I'm gonna see myself as lovable, resilient, approval. And then I'm gonna act on the behavior that reinforces who I think I am, okay? And so there is a process that happens that motivates this. I get an inner hurt tap. I think I'm unlovable. All of a sudden, I'm less than and separate from. If my brain is unregulated and unintegrated, I'm gonna use anger to deal with it. Now it's either gonna be anger against myself, i.e. suicide, anxiety, or anger against somebody else. Homicide, lashing out, okay. But I'm gonna project the damage onto somebody else if I can. If I can't do that, it'll be back on me, okay. But I wanna get away from the pain. And what we do, you have a weak inner self, you fear the loss of safety or belonging, you're gonna either project that anger onto you or somebody else. And what we know is there's a process called validation, which I don't have time to explain, but it's in the book. It's a process called validation where you move the child or the adult from a weak inner self to a strong inner self with a consequence. So I looked at my time, I can give one example. And here's the process you use. But what you are doing is you're motivating good behavior. Let me um, give this example. When my son was in the uh, fourth grade, he came home from school and he said, mom, I'm, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, he was crying. So I just said, so what happened? I'm not gonna argue with him, he believes it. And you want to help him identify the hurt. He said, well, I knew another way to do the math problem today. And the teacher told me it was stupid. It was dumb. And I shouldn't be doing it that way and not to talk about it again. So then you help them identify the ways in which it's not true. I said, so Tom, did your way work? He said, yes. Did you get the right answer? He said, yes. I said, was it faster than what the teacher showed you? He said, yes. So I said, well, then it's actually not true that you're stupid, right? And he said, well, I guess not. I said, so why do you think your teacher at, told you not to do it? So you visit the thinking of the other person. He said, I have no idea. Then you go to the deep value or strength the person has. I said, so Tom, the real issue here is this. You're smarter than the teacher. He said, that's not possible. I said, why is that not possible? He said, he has a college degree and I don't. I said, Tom. He's better educated than you are. You're smarter than he is. I said, but the reality is this. And then you move to consequences. I said, the reality is this. He has more authority than you do. And all your life, you're going to run into people who have more authority than you, and you're smarter than they are. So I said, let me ask you this question. Does it hurt you to do the problem his way? He said, no. I said, can you do it his way? He said, yes. I said, then here's what you're going to do. You're going to do it his way because he has more authority than you do. In the future, you can do it the way you want to do it. But right now, you need to do it the way he told you to do it. That's validation. What you are saying to the person is you move him from a weak inner self to a strong inner self. Now, if I said to him, that's just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Buck it up, boy. You know, what's, what's the problem with you? It would have just validated even further that weak inner self. That's the last thing you want him to think. You know, the teachers already made him think he's stupid. 
then you say that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You're not smart. You're not stupid. Da, 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 da. You just dug it in deeper. And what you're doing is moving them to a a, uh, a validation. It's a fabulous tool. Now, also in the book is this thing on bonding attachment, and what we look at is the four styles of bonding and attachment and how that then focuses on discipline. There's one style called safe and dangerous, uh, which you have both parents and students in. Uh, and 10% of all the population in general is safe and dangerous, or as they say in the research, disorganized and dismissive. And if you have children who come out of drug addicted households, the research is that 80% of them are safe and dangerous. And we know that shooters come typically from either anxious, anxious avoidant or safe and dangerous, okay? Um, just because you're in that group doesn't mean you're gonna shoot, but it means that that's where the tendency is for them to come from. And suicides tend to come out of the anxious group. And how you then uh, anxious and ambivalent, how you deal with them and how you discipline them is very different, okay? Now, I wanna go to the last part, the emotional noise in the classroom, and then open it up for questions. So, let me ask you this question in the chat box. Who just walked into your classroom? Who just walked into your classroom? Well, when a lot of people go, well, I have 25 students. No, uh-uh. A lot more people than you realize walked in. Johnny brought in his dead mother, his angry father, and his drug addicted sister. And you brought your own people in too, okay? Take a minute and talk in the chat box. Who do you bring to work with you? Who comes inside your head with you? Is it your husband, your your spouse, your significant other, your children, your dog, your mother-in-law, who you bring in the room with you? If you don't mind typing in the chat box, who are you bringing in? Yeah, everybody, All right. And your classroom actually looks like this. You thought you had 25 people in there, you don't. You got 75 people in there, okay? And, there's a lot of emotional noise in that room. And many times when students react, it's not even you they're reacting to. It's the people they brought with them. Right, exactly, Deborah. that's exactly correct. So it's this whole concept of emotional noise, okay? And these are things that influence emotional noise in the classroom. What the kids, the teacher. But I wanna identify two things for adults that that adults bring in with noise and one of them is their energy level and we don't talk about this very much but it's huge i can tell you from my own experience i can tell you how good how well something's going to go a presentation by the level of energy i bring in and some people have bigger energy levels bigger engines than other people do but what happens to adults is this your energy continues to grow until you're in your mid to late 30s, at 35, 38 in there. Then it levels off. But what happens is your responsibilities continue to grow until you're in your mid 60s. So like in your 20s and 30s, you entered into responsibilities like children, like a mortgage, like a career, okay? And all of a sudden you get in your around 40 and you go, wait a minute, I don't know about this. And we find that it's a huge issue in teaching right now because a lot of teachers were in their early 40s, 20 years ago when they got into teaching, teaching was a lot easier. The students were a lot easier. I mean, and all of a sudden it's like, what is going on? And I got another 20 years so I can retire. I, I just don't know if I can do this, okay? What happens in that discrepancy between the responsibility and between the energy is that people start worrying. 
and they give more room to their anxieties. How, how many of you, if you don't mind in the chat box, how many of you have gone to work, but while you at work, you did not think about work. You thought about what you were worrying about. How many of you have done that? Right. Yeah. You were physically there, but your energy wasn't there. And what we find is this. When people get involved in anxiety, they get in what if conversations in their head. What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? Okay. And the bottom line is you need to keep your head at what is. Okay. And this gets exacerbated by where we are or the adult is in their stages of adult development. So let me say some things about stages of adult development. All our lives, we undergo changes in four areas of perception. Who we think we are in relationship to each other, to other people, the proportion of danger or safety we feel in our lives, what we think about time, and how alive versus how stagnant we are. The research is that you can avoid developmental tasks. You don't have to do them. And you have to do developmental tasks around identity, intimacy, okay, independence. What can I do on my own? Value, i.e. work. What do I bring of value, okay? How do I deal with aging and death, okay? How do I deal with time, okay? And what happens is those change all our lives. So one of the things we know, for example, is that people bring in their developmental tasks into work with them. And one of the things we'll see, I just want to make this comment about aliveness and stagnation. Everybody has a wound. Every person's got some sort of wound or wounds in their life. Okay? Everybody's got them. Okay, you will, if you can find a way to make that wound a part of you, you tend to stay alive. If you make that wound define you, then you tend to stagnate. So let me put this in the chat box. When your wound defines you, you stagnate. When it is a part of you, you can stay alive. Let me give you an example. So one of the things you will see in adults is they're unable to get past that. I'll give you an example. I found out my, my son is gay. I found out he was gay when he was 16. When he wrote, wrote his uh, college application, he did not put in there in his autobiography that he was gay. And I said, Tom, you, you didn't put that in there. He goes, no, mom. He goes, do you put in your autobiography that you're heterosexual? He said, no. I said, look, mom, it's a part of me, but it does not define me. And one of the things I will say is that part of what happens in these developmental stages is, where are you? A couple things in this whole thing of aliveness versus stagnation. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but two point, two things I'm just gonna highlight for you. In your 20s, what people in their 20s have to figure out is identity, intimacy, and independence. Work, relationships, who am I, okay? Okay, yeah, uh, Aisha, that's a good question. I'll answer that in a more, in just one minute, okay? But the bottom line is that in your 20s, you, if you don't have a mentor for your career in your 20s or for your life, particularly in your career, the research is that it's actually a developmental handicap for your whole life, okay? And another interesting thing about your 20s, if you marry in your 20s, you almost always marry a person who is a uh, replacement for one of your parents. I know, that's real comforting, okay? And the most uh, dangerous time to be an adult is between the ages of 35 and 45. More adults fall off the wagon for many, many reasons during that time than any other age. Now, Asia asked this question. 
What if we want to do more than just stay alive? What if we want to thrive? How do you get past your wounds? In the book, there is an activity. You don't have to, uh, the research is, you don't have to accept the bonding and attachment styles that you grew up with, nor the wounds you grew up with. And there's an activity in the book that you can do if you want to get beyond it. And what the research says is this, if you want to do that, you have to do something called uh, um, a uh, life narrative. And in your life narrative, you have to be able to see your caregivers or the people who damaged you or helped you. You have to look at them, not through the eyes of a child, but as if you were another adult looking at that first, your caregiver as an adult. And then you look at their strengths and their weaknesses as if you were another adult looking at them. And then you can change the patterns. Uh, Cynthia, no, it's not covered in our rules. And uh, Aisha, I have one more book for you. There's a book I'm gonna recommend called The Mind-Body Code by Mario Martinez. And in that book, he identifies tools you can use to actually move beyond he calls them toxic uh, co-authors, is what he calls them. People who gave you a, co-authored you in a toxic way. And he teaches you how to replace those toxic co-authors so they're not in your head anymore. It's a wonderful book. So I'm going to stop there. There's a lot of other uh, information in the book, but I'm gonna stop now. It's 11.53, I said I was gonna stop at 11.45. So we have about seven minutes to entertain questions. Yes, when dealing with the homeless students at my college, this is a big thing I see. 45 year olds still stuck on they did this, exactly. And Cynthia, when they're doing that, they're letting the wound define them. And so one of the, the other thing I do with them is you have to then say to them, you're letting the wound define you, okay? How do we make this a part of you? And it's something you have to do to stay alive. I would recommend Cynthia, the mind body code to you as well. Um, but it, there's also in the emotional poverty book, a strategy, a simpler strategy to begin that conversation. And the other thing that in the research is this, the loss always comes before the gain. And many people don't know that. The loss always comes before the gain. The book is Mind Body Code by um, Mario Martinez. But the loss always comes before the gain and that's hard for people to know. Looking at my blood family as adults and myself as an adult also allowed me to create family sustainable boundaries with them with great peace. Yes, Shelly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, and when you're dealing with adult siblings that cannot take the blame however slight for anything, then one of the things you know, Val, about that adult sibling is that somewhere in the early years there, there was a great deal of shame about who you are. Um, and Tammy, the book about life narrative is in my book, Emotional Poverty, and that you can go and it gives you the activity to do to figure it out. All righty, any other questions? Yes, yes, uh-huh. Thank you, Cynthia, yeah. Um, and we, for those of you that are involved with getting ahead, I'm looking to do a follow-up book for getting ahead on just emotional issues. Um, yeah. Thank you, Cynthia, I've got them, I've got haters, but I think if you're doing anything, everybody's got them hate haters, okay. Thank you all so much and we do not sell the book Emotional Poverty on Amazon because Amazon takes 55%. So if you want the book, let me uh, go forward now to a uh, grid here. And here's how you get more information if you'd like to have it. Our website is ahaprocess.com and you can get the book on there. But we are not selling Emotional Poverty on Amazon.com. Thank you, Ruby, for a wonderful workshop, um, webinar, introduction. If you go to ahaprocess.com, you will see that Ruby is delivering full day 
emotional poverty workshops across the country in various locations. Um, we also have a certification process for emotional process and we uh, will be in uh, Fort Worth in June. So we thank you for joining. This is recorded and uh, once we get a process, we will send it out and email it to everybody next week. And we uh, thank you for your time. Again, thank you so much and I hope you have a great Easter. Thank you.